Good evening. My talk is on heterogeneity. Okay. Uh, my talk is on heterogeneity and its challenges. Rheumatologists have a love-hate relationship with heterogeneity. We love heterogeneity. What we deal with, however, is also a hatred for heterogeneity. It comes back to haunt us in trying to design treatment regimens, in trying to design trials. But I don't think we'd be happy as cardiologists. We need to know everything about, except maybe for the money, uh, we need to know everything about everything. And we want to know everything about everything. So in this talk, I just want to talk to you about the challenges of individualized therapy and disease heterogeneity. Here are my disclosures. So what I'll cover is the basis of disease heterogeneity, the impact of heterogeneity, the challenges introduced by diversity, and some of the solutions. So a few years ago, the Lupus Foundation in New York City, the SLE Foundation, asked me to help them with a brochure. And the topic of their brochure was, like fingerprints, no two cases are alike. And the point was getting across, but I thought it was a little bit too criminal. So my suggestion was change it to, like snowflakes, no two cases are alike. And these two cases illustrate the diversity, the heterogeneity. So in case one, I'm concerned about the patient, but not nearly as concerned as in case two, a 22-year-old African-American female who's had arthritis and hypertension and nephritis, who's serologically active, thrombocytopenia, and proves to be refractory to high doses of steroids and MMF. She's facing dialysis in the future. This is what we're up against, a vast spectrum of disease activity. The basis of heterogeneity relates to a lot of different things, to genetics, to epigenetics. There's a lot of diversity in pathogenetic mechanisms, pathways and autoantibodies, for example. We've heard a lot during this conference about demographics, ethnicity and race, as well as socioeconomic factors. Here's a very recent publication looking at polymorphisms from GWAS studies. And what you see on the top line, 80 polymorphic sites sitting on 16 different chromosomes, encompassing a variety of different pathways involving T cells, B cells, interferon, and so forth. We see a lot of heterogeneity in autoantibodies. I have different concerns in my patients who have anti-DNA antibodies or anti-Smith antibodies. I worry a lot about their kidneys. In patients with SSA and SSB antibodies, different concerns. They'll often have subacute cutaneous lupus. I worry during their pregnancies about neonatal lupus syndrome. Patients with RNP antibodies, yet different phenotype. And the antiphospholipid antibody patients, thrombosis and obstetrical complications. And we could go on and on with various autoantibodies, but this just speaks to the diversity. There are many different causes of tissue injury and many different molecular pathways. So for example, just dealing with autoantibodies, some antibodies can directly bind their target, and some feel this is responsible for central nervous system dysfunction. Immune complexes formed by DNA and DNA antibodies can trigger nephritis. Antibody-dependent cytotoxicity is yet another mechanism, a mechanism that we see in autoimmune thrombocytopenia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and on the far right, complement-dependent cytotoxicity, a mechanism seen in autoimmune hemolytic anemia of the cold type. A variety of cell types are involved, and I'm sure their involvement varies from patient to patient. We also have involvement of the vasculature. Some patients have large vessel unifocal thrombosis, yet other patients will have small vessel diffuse thrombotic microangiopathy, and yet others leukoagglutination. We've heard a lot about ethnicity and race during this meeting, and this is a nice table from Pons Estelle's article in 2010. 
And I certainly have different concerns in my, pa I'm, I have plenty of sick Caucasians in my practice, but I have different concerns with young African American females. So in this table, you can see the incidence in this column, female prevalence, and survival in various parts of the world. And we, we know this, but here's a way to quantify it. So what is the impact of heterogeneity? And I'd like to discuss clinical manifestations, disease activity, and therapeutic responses. A picture is worth a thousand words. Here you have almost 30 pictures. I need not say any more. You deal with this. Incredible diversity at the phenotypic level. Disease activity. Though I have plenty of females in my practice, my male patients are particularly ill. We've heard about demographics and their role, the ethnicity and racial issues, and age. My pediatric colleagues taught me many years ago how sick young kids with lupus can be. We've heard a lot about socioeconomic factors. And seasonal variation I learned before I even entered rheumatology. I was a second year resident at New York Hospital and I thought it would be a good time to rotate through the hospital for special surgery. July, summer months, it would be an easy rotation. Well, within the first two nights on call, I admitted four of Mike Lockshin's lupus patients, and three out of the four ended up in the intensive care unit. So we do see seasonal variation, worse disease in the summer and early fall. And this is taken from Michelle Petrie's article, looking at damage using univariate and multivariate analyses. These are some of the attributes, ethnicity and race, that contributed to damage. So African-American race, gender, male, age, socioeconomic status, disease activity, serologic activity, as well as the lupus anticoagulant, and most of all, steroid use. We've seen heterogeneity in therapeutic responses in some of our trials. So for example, in the ALMS trial, blacks and Hispanics did better with mycophenolate. In the LUNAR trial, they were really talking about small numbers. In the blacks, Rituxan outperformed placebo, whereas in the rest of cohort, it was pretty much even. And in the BLISS trials, a contentious issue at the FDA Advisory Committee meeting, it seemed that subset analysis showed that African Americans did worse than rest of cohort in the phase three study. But in the phase two study, it was the opposite. And we heard yesterday, yesterday from Chris Collins that in the observed trial, African Americans performed the same as rest of cohort. So be careful with subset analyses. We see some heterogeneity as far as toxicity. In the ALMS trial, there were many more deaths in Asia on mycophenolate. And in the BELONG trial, which was terminated prematurely because of opportunistic infections, there were more opportunistic infections in Asia. So why is this important? Well, we need to pronosticate. We need to identify the high-risk patient. Therefore, we could optimize therapeutics such to reduce disease activity and prevent damage. And this is particularly important in perfecting clinical trial designs. Now, a lot of this we do already. We do it subconsciously. But there's certainly room for refinement. But there are challenges. There are challenges of heterogeneity. And they actually will rise with the number of pathogenetic mechanisms, with the number of different clinical phenotypes, with the number of therapeutic options. Think about rheumatoid arthritis. We now have so many different drugs to choose from in rheumatoid arthritis, but we don't know in which order to choose them. And the variability in response to interventions, the effects on pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, efficacy, and toxicity. So what are some solutions? Well, with pathogenetic mechanisms, we're always looking for more, but it's important to correlate them with manifestations and response to deal with the heterogeneity of clinical manifestations and disease activity, we've generated activity instruments. 
and a little bit about that in just a bit. And then for response to therapeutic interventions, we need to identify predictors of response and incorporate these into entry criteria for clinical trials and maybe even stratify on those factors. So dealing with heterogeneity in clinical trials, there are activity instruments, which you well know. The SLEDI and the BILAG are the two most popular ones right now. We've gone a step beyond that with composite indices, the SRI, which stands for the SLE Responder Index, and the BICLA, which is the BILAG-based composite lupus assessment. And these are more important for clinical trials than everyday practice. But they allow us to take a heterogeneous population and study them and see if they're responding to interventions. And here's a table just showing the two composite indices, the SRI and the BICLA. The SRI driven by a reduction in SLEDI, and the BICLA driven by a BILAG reduction. Some more solutions. We need to figure out predictors of response, and we could do this at many different levels. So at the clinical level, look at clinical domains, and this was done in the BLISS trials. And we saw that patients at baseline who had mucocutaneous involvement, musculoskeletal involvement, or vascular involvement responded to drug. That's not to say other manifestations won't respond, but these were the ones that came out statistically on top. We can look at degrees of dis disease activity, and this was also done in BLISS 52 and BLISS 76, and what we learned is that patients with a sleet eye of 10 or greater responded better than those with a sleet eye less than 10. The term high disease activity refers to those patients with low complement and high DNA antibodies. And these patients outperformed the rest of cohort. Similar results were seen in the Blisvima mode study. High disease activity defined a little bit differently. Salinas sleet eye 10 or greater and on steroids. And these patients who received the experimental drug at the highest dose outperformed rest of cohort. Biomarkers, we haven't done so well. Here are two examples where biomarkers have not been helpful. But there are, still are major efforts underway to predict response based upon biomarkers. In the BLISS trials, nearly everybody had elevated BLISS levels. But doing a quartile analysis, it was determined that baseline BLISS did not correlate with week 52 SRI. In the rontalizumab study, which we heard about this morning, it was not the high interferon signature metric that responded to drug as we thought it would be. It was actually the low interferon signature metric. So in the future, we will have many more medicines. We will someday have biomarkers. And we will someday have individual therapy. And this will all lead to better outcomes. But until then, integrate science. But remember that treating lupus remains an art. Thank you.